Thank you very much for having me. I, as Dig says, this is my fight with the modern laptop. It's a fight I've been having for a while now, and I see no end in sight. So this is the story so far. Um, a bit about myself. I, I'm a system administrator. That's how people might call it DevOps these days. But as part of that, I like to pull things apart. I like to know how they work. I like to put them back together the way that works for me. Now, if I can do that for all my hardware that I do at work, I can do that for all my experimental things that I'm putting together at home, why can't I do that for my laptop? Which makes me a grumpy guy. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, something that I'm angry with people about. I want to be constructive about this. I don't want to just be the, the grumpy guy who's angry about my laptop. So what can I do? So I'm going to try and take you through the things that I want to do, the reasons why I like to do them, what I had to go through to get to the point where I am now, and what possibly can happen in the future. So first off, how did I start this? I got a new laptop, and I liked it. And this is the story that I could tell for many years. I got a new laptop, and it was better than the one before. But that stopped happening. The laptop started getting features removed. Rather than having things that I wanted, they started removing the things that I'd come to rely on. And it's really angry making for me. But what I want to try and do is give you the feeling that you can do something about this. It doesn't have to be a laptop, but take you through what I have done in concepts of how you can investigate it and show you some of the tools you can use to investigate it and then say, try and take ownership. When something like that happens that makes you say, what can I do to fix it? Be able to have an answer. I don't, you know, I'm not sure that this is the future I want to end up in. But I do know what I want from my laptop. I've got a list. It's not a list that I can fill these days. There's a lot of things that have got better. But I can't fill my perfect laptop. There's a, it's quite a long list, so I can't necessarily do all of it. I have to focus on what I can do. If I only focus on what I can do, then maybe I can make small incremental changes. And the laptop in question was a couple of years ago when they actually felt like they jumped the shark with the, the laptops. And I could look at one big change they'd made. They'd made a big change to the keyboard. So I said, can I change that? Can I fix the keyboard? It, they'd removed some keys that I used. They'd changed the layout of where I expected my muscle memory to go. I do a lot of typing. I expect to be able to just put my keys down and my fingers down and type on the keys. But is it possible to make that one change? Let's ignore all the other things that are on my wish list. I can come back to that in the future with luck. This is what the keyboards looked like for the entire time I've been buying ThinkPads. And because I was happy with it, I kept on buying ThinkPads. They all look pretty much the same. You can see changes if you look closely, but they look pretty much the same. Up until that 2011 one, where the next model after that, they completely changed. Now, a lot of things stayed the same. Yes, it is still a keyboard. Yes, you can still type on it. I'm not going to convince everybody that this keyboard is bad. But for me, they'd removed an entire row of keys. Now, I didn't really like the island layout as well, but I've typed on a lot of island keyboards since then. And maybe my standards are slipping, but I can probably get by with the islands. But I wanted those extra row of keys back. And some of these keyboards have got very strange decisions in them. Who would make a keyboard with these designs? But they made them. And strange decisions in keyboards are not something that's happened and then went away again. This is from a currently selling MacBook. Where's my escape key? Now, to be fair, you can buy one that has an escape key if you go and go have that as, an ex as a requirement. But it's clearly that the keyboard being weird is not something that's going away. People are keeping on doing this. So if I look at the last one that I thought was good and the next one, the first one that I thought was bad, I think that there's a bunch of things that I like about the old one. And most of it is that it's what I'm used to. 
So how do I bring what I used to into the one that is a newer laptop? Because the laptop's getting old. Maybe I can just replace the hardware. Pulled one of these apart, and it turns out that the connector that the keyboard uses to attach to the motherboard is the same. We've got the old keyboard and the new motherboard, and the connector, it's the same. Oh, what happens if I just plug it in? Maybe that'll work. Or maybe something will go wrong. Now, you probably can't see it in that photo, and you might not be able to see it in that photo either. I think it's probably visible. The, I didn't even notice this when I'd done it. Turns out that the connector is not quite the same, and when you plug the old keyboard in the new laptop, it's trying to send the high current backlight power through a very thin little wire. And in my case, I blew up a little tiny speck. I was lucky, I blew up the right spot. I'd plugged three keyboards in by this point. <laughs> I blew them all up in the same way. Other people blew it up in a way that, when I say blow up, it's this tiny, tiny little puff of smoke that goes. But other people blew it up in a way that made the mouse button stop working. Now, there's a way around this. Somebody worked out you can pull apart this bit of metal here and slide in a, um, a little uh, insulating bit of tape and stop those particular high voltage, high current lines from affecting things. You know, we can get past that initial problem. But even once that's done, there's a bunch of keys that don't quite work properly. So the keys that I wanted back on the seventh row, some of them are dead keys now. You press them, nothing happens. And the keys that you use for the special functions, like to put the laptop to sleep the, or um, change which display is active, there's a whole lot of them in the little icons up here, they don't match. So when you press the appropriate icon on the keyboard that you've got plugged in, it does something completely different. So this is turn on the trackpad, and this is brightness go down. So, you know, I can get out my white uh, Tipex and relabel the keys, and I did consider doing that, but it felt like, eh, it's a little bit wonky. What else can I do? Can I fix this in some way? Again, there is prior art for this. Somebody said, yes, I can fix that. And they got out their Stanley knife, and they got out their really fine bits of wire, and they rewired the entire keyboard to put the keys back in the right spot. I, mean, uh, I don't think that's really the answer I'm looking for. There's got to be a more elegant way. I was able to find the circuit layout for the new laptop and confirmed that all of the keys on the keyboard were actually wired up. So it's not like these seventh row dead keys are not physically connected anymore or they've changed the connector in such a big way that it doesn't work. No, they're all connected. They're all wired up. So it's all just software that the problem is. I should be able to fix this. If it was open source software, I'd just go and submit a patch and it would all be working. There'd be no more story at this point. It's not open source software. So I can dig deeper and can find out what else exists. How is the keyboard defined? How does the computer know how the keyboard works? Luckily, eventually, I found somebody from over a decade ago had done some reverse engineering of a much older laptop and they'd left that online somewhere. It's gone now, there's a Wayback Machine link that I've got to it. But what it had was the keyboard definition table. It had this key lock tab, and it had the magic numbers they were using to describe the key layout. And I could look at those magic numbers and pull up the firmware update file for both my old laptop and my new laptop. And I could find this exactly the same numbers. And when I go through the rest of the numbers, in all three of them, they all pretty much match. There's like, I don't know, a seventh row worth of keys that are different. But the rest of them match. So this is the keyboard table as defined in the original download firmware update from Lenovo. But 
how do I, how do I patch it? How do I change it? What do I need to fix? I thought it was straightforward at this point. I said, oh, you know, I've got the old keyboard table here and I've got the new keyboard table here. I just copy one after the other. Mm, that doesn't work because the firmware has got a checksum. You can't upload corrupted firmware to your laptop because that might break it. So after I patched it, the tools just said, I can't, I can't install that. That firmware is not valid. So, you know, it might be worth having a quick look at where is this being installed? Can I program it some other way? What is the firmware actually for? And in this particular case, there's several blobs of firmware that come with the laptop, but the one that the keyboard was from, the keyboard table was from, is the embedded controller. Now, if you've never heard about this, every laptop, to a first approximation, every laptop has an embedded controller. Most other computers will have an embedded controller. And it, it's basically the dumb little computer that takes care of the things that the big computer doesn't want to deal with. The mouse, the keyboard, is the battery full? Do you have the right kind of battery plugged in? In some case, it'll take care of suspend and resume and the fans and just little niggly things that aren't running the latest version of Office. But it's an entire embedded controller, which is a computer, a CPU, it's got its own flash memory to store the program in, it's got a, its own RAM, it's got its own probably it's almost an operating system in there. It's completely separate from the main computer. So in order to patch it, I'm going to need to work out how to actually get in there and fix that. In this particular case, that research didn't work out very well. It's unfortunately in many cases, these things are um, proprietary. The embedded controller has a model number, has a spec sheet. The spec sheet's only three pages long. It doesn't tell you anything about it. It doesn't tell you how to program it. So I'm going to need to wait until somebody else comes up with a better answer. Which is where, conveniently, not that many months after I started thinking that maybe this was possible, somebody else got annoyed that his new laptop he bought didn't work with the old batteries that fitted into it. Because this was ZMAT. And he said, right, that's it. I can fix this. And he worked out where in that firmware the checksums were stored. He also discovered that the firmware was encrypted. And he worked out how to unencrypt it to get the original firmware back and then re-encrypt it to make sure that the checksum still worked after it had been patched for his one small patch to fix the battery. So this is good. I've now got the part that I needed in order to do the flashing. But there were still things that weren't quite working, like the top row keys. So I needed to investigate further and say, OK, taking his work as inspiration, he's clearly got an example of here's what he did and here's how he went through it. I went, oh, OK, if I understand more about how the actual source code in the firmware works, if I reverse engineer what's being run on that embedded controller. So I went around and I had a look for the tool that I could use to do this. Radair is the tool that I came up with. And well, Radair is a very complicated tool with a quite a high learning curve. But that wasn't the first problem. It theoretically has support for the architecture of the CPU that's running on the embedded controller. And when I started up, I thought, oh, fantastic, it just works. And then I looked a little bit closer at the pictures that I was showing, and, and this is actually rubbish. All the um, assembly language that it's come up with is right, but all the helpful hints that Radar is trying to show me to help me reverse engineer things are wrong. And there's a bunch of red, hard to read things down here. They're all based on the reverse engineering stuff that it's automatically analyze, anal, anal, analyzing. And then it's got some coloring and stuff that is based on that. It's all wrong. So I perhaps ended up yak shaving for a while and went back to Rad Air and figured out what was wrong with the CPU code for that. Now this felt at the time like it was maybe wasting time. 
it was a bit of effort to work out the CPU to fix the RADAIR code for that CPU and then bring across the appropriate configuration and uh, decoding settings for that CPU. But as a result of doing that, I ended up getting a lot more familiarity with RADAIR, which is what I needed to do more work later. So I was able to submit my changes into RADAIR and they it's now in the upstream code. So the next person who comes along and tries to work on that code base will have more luck, hopefully. There's still plenty of things to fix. But I went back to what I was actually doing. And here's the same code. There's now, there's now the, right, the right structure showing up. There's much less in the way of magic numbers on the side here that it's diagnosed. And if you follow the logic of the code, it now makes sense which made my life a lot easier when I actually tried to use the features of Red Air to reverse engineer what I was looking at. Now, I ended up, annoyingly perhaps, I ended up not using a lot of the reverse engineering of the CPU because most of what I was found in the end to target was just data structures. There was the data structure describing how the keyboard was laid out and a bunch of other things like that. Those were in not the CPU area. So I could have just skipped all that bit. But I learned how to use Red Air because I had to dig into its internals. So this is the keyboard table that I originally looked at and found displayed in Red Air. And to start my process, I would say, OK, I can tell Red Air to flag this with a name. Down the bottom there, I've said, oh, it's a keyboard table, key tab. And you can tell it how big and what area of memory, and Red Air now knows about that, which gives us the ability to say, what else in the firmware points at this table? Because something must use that keyboard table somewhere. So I can ask it to search, sign me references the key tab. Now, luckily, there was only one, so this was a really simple question to ask. And I can say, OK, what's, what has it found? What is in that search result? Print out at the search result and then go back a little bit so we can see what's before that. And we can see it's highlighted the hit that it found. But there's, it looks like maybe there's something before it a little bit and it's a little bit scrambled. So I can print it out in a different way. So I show it as a series of 32-bit integers instead and I can see immediately, it jumps out at me. Okay, I've got, this looks like a length. This is a pointer to the key table. This is a pointer to something else, and same with that. So, oh, I can start seeing the structure in there. Now, this is a lot faster than happened in reality. I sat there and went cross-eyed and looked at it and stuff. But it's that whole pulling up the data, looking at one way, rotating it, looking at it again, and going, oh, I think I see what's going on here. So let's make that assumption that I've found a, a list of pointers to other things to do with the keyboard. So I've flagged it as list key tab. I've given it a, a length and an address again. And you can do other things, like I reckon that the, the 110 is a key tab size. So I'll put a comment in there. I've given it a comment. And if I'm right, then that's four bytes long. So I'll just define that as a four byte area, which all feeds into Red Air's internal database that it can show you when I go back and print out, well, what I'm actually printing out here is I thought this looked like a pointer to something interesting. So I'm using that as the address to point to. But I can now see also that it's giving me the thing I've just defined. It's showing me the size of it. It's highlighted it all so it comes out. It's doing that automatically. And it starts showing me the structure that I've discovered as I tag parts of it. But I can also look at it and say, oh, I reckon I've found something there. This FF007, F00, that looks like something. So I'm going to, I guess that it's this size, engeducated guess, and I gave it a name. Which means I can now go back to my original key list that I found and print it out again a different way. There's umpteen ways of printing it out. This way prints it out in a way that tries to make it look like assembly language but you can see that it's got the comment I defined, 
it's given me the where is this pointing at, and it shows it as a actual something that starts to look like it's recognizable. So you can do that repeatedly. <laughs> there's a lot of this in there. And I didn't always use Red Air to do it. There's, there's lots of other tools, some really simple ones. I didn't, didn't know that Hexdump had a shortcut name. HD just gives you the output that looks normal to me as hex dumps. So it's a lot shorter to type as well. But a lot of what I was doing when I was comparing the two versions of the firmware, I had to go and find some way of visualizing the difference between two binary files. So vbin diff is invaluable for that. You can scroll around, you can find the things that are the same, find the things that are different. And I use this tool, now that I've got it, I use this tool all the time. And then HTE, I showed a, um, a screenshot of this earlier. It is just a hex editor tool. It's a relatively self-contained, relatively small, relatively simple version of the same kind of thing of what Red Air does. So while I was using it mostly as a hex editor, it turns out it's got a, an assembler and a disassembler built in as well. So with one tool that's a little bit more visual, a little bit more easy to use, I can do some things that Red Air might be a little bit like hitting a fly with a cannon. And I can, again, this is a tool that I have installed most of my systems because I'll just, if I need a hex editor, I'll pop it up. If it looks like something interesting, I can go further. If it looks like it's a complicated project, I'll start up a project in Red Air where I name all the structures. And finally, Another tool, the final tool that I found invaluable is Binwalk, which will go through the binary you've given it and look for the signatures of various things in it. Interesting things, things you might be wanting to know about, like there is a, a UEFI header in there. Turns out in this particular file, that UEFI header is bogus, but it also found some uh, compressed data, a GIF image, and it can extract all these things. So I can give it command line options and end up with a directory full of the random things it finds. And it'll find, um, uh, there's not one on here, it'll find uh, stuff that looks like it could be private keys and public keys. It's fairly broad matching for that, so it sometimes finds things that are not. But instead of me having to do that, I can just go through and say, that's a bad match and delete it. So having all these tools, I can now go back to actually what I was trying to do in the first place. So more looking at structures, more just comparing how things looked in the two different versions, the old and the new, more looking around. And it's a tree of structures that point to each other. They have different formats and different layouts and it all gets a little bit weird because they're clearly making sense to it when they wrote it, but it's the reverse engineering part doesn't have to make sense to me because I'm not the target audience. So it's perseverance and it's realising that if you stare at it for long enough, it will just start clicking. But it does help when somebody else stares at it. Because around about this point, I'm looking for, I've got my keyboard patched, but the dead keys still don't work. So, and I couldn't figure out how to fix that. But I've been posting some of my um, updates on, uh, on, on ZMAT's blog, I think I said what I was doing. And uh, some guy in Russia contacted me and said, hey, are you working on this stuff? And we started talking about it. And he said, I think I've found where the dead keys are. So he was the one who found the bitmap table. So Nitrocaster is um, still working with Lenovo stuff and he sells all kinds of bits and pieces for the Lenovo stuff. So, He's clearly been working on this for, for ages and I was lucky enough to get his help at the point where I needed it. Just by saying on, online, hey, I'm working on this stuff. Somebody found me and contacted me. And that was the bitmap list. So I could turn on the dead keys. There's this bitmap of these are the keys that are actually allowed to do things. And then together we found the two other lists that were needed to change the fun key combinations. I don't know why there are two lists, but there were two lists. 
and both of them were needed to do all of the complete set. And you end up with the little structure that you, that you draw showing you where all the bits are. It gets bigger and bigger as you find out more about it. At one point, I built a, an automated tool to try and find all the structures in there. It's um, a lot larger than this. This is just the tables that come off from the top-level keyboard table. There's, um, uh, I, I was a bit surprised at how much data they needed in there. But it was all there. And because I'd found all the bits that I needed, I could declare success at this point. I've got my laptop, I've got my keyboard, I'm happy, I'm good to go. But what about everybody else? So I published. Well, Nitrocaster and I both talked about what bits we'd done and showed hex dumps to people. Here, just patch this bit to here and then run this tools and all will be good, off you go. And it turned out that nobody really understood what we were saying. The people who were reading the ThinkPad forums, who wanted to do this to their ThinkPads, the kind of people who had been getting out their, their knives and rewiring their keyboard manually, they really wanted to do this, but they didn't know what we were saying. They couldn't follow it. So that was when I discovered that my audience was a lot more diverse and a lot wider than what I had originally thought. So it wasn't just let's document where the bits were and tell people flip this bit and run this tool. It was a package it all up, try and document better, try and collect everything that we can in one spot and then automate all those bits. Give it to them in a way that is as simple as possible. Now I went through a different, couple of different iterations of this. Firstly was the one of, of realising that uh, no matter how simple I made it, there would always be somebody who wanted it simpler. So I made a line for myself. I wasn't going to try and build this for Windows. I did say, here's how to bring up a virtual machine. Here's what you can do to get you to the point where you can build your USB stick with the patches in it. So hopefully a lot of people were able to get past that and do that part. I did look into what I could do for Windows and the, the stumbling block was I couldn't find a tool that was easy and small to distribute that could apply binary diffs to things. And that was, that was I, I was just a bit surprised. I couldn't even construct one of these without learning how PowerShell worked from a, you know, to actually do all this, learning an entire new language. I'm like, no, 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 how about I just tell people I can make it work for you and I can tell you how to use it in Linux, which worked. But then there was the problem of, well, everybody just said, why don't you distribute the patched binaries? And I still get this question. Wouldn't it be great if you could just publish the patched binaries? They have a copyright in them. They're not owned by me. I don't know that they would go after me, but how about if I just don't even try? I'm patching, I'm providing the instructions on how to patch. You're downloading the, the software owned by Lenovo and then patching it. So I bypassed that completely. But that wasn't the last problem that people had. Everybody had their laptop that they liked. And it wasn't the laptop that I liked. And they all said, well, can it work on this one too? It turned out it could. We got seven, lap seven different laptops supported in the end. Um, in the code repository, I've got some debugging information for a lot more than seven laptops. But I can only patch seven laptops. And that was kind of amazing to be able to do that. I was also able to, at this point, because I had to make it relatively streamlined to do seven different laptops, I was also able to take the original battery patch that ZMAT had done and apply that to all of the seven laptops. So people can take aftermarket batteries and plug them into their one uh, range of laptops. So the seven laptops were all the XX30 ThinkPad laptops. So I had a X230 
and I could take any X220 laptop battery and plug it into my X230, and it'd work with this patch. This patch. And I'm like, oh, that, that's kind of useful too. About half the people I uh, had reports from are interested in the keyboard, and the other half are interested in the battery. So it's um, not a given which one people are going to want. One of the things that I did ask, though, the way that I got people to patch their firmware was build this bootable disk, pull that bootable disk out, plug it into your laptop, boot up, and that pretty much mirrors the way you install the firmware normally. But what Lenovo did in software, could I do that in software? At which point the process could be, on your laptop, run this program that I supply you, and it would talk to exactly the same place that the Lenovo provider DOS Flash did. So I spent a little bit of time seeing if I could make that bit simpler, because uh, if I can avoid building a MS-DOS boot disk and telling people to reboot into it, then that would probably be good for my sanity. But how do I find out what this DOS Flash tool was doing? So this takes me into a, another segue almost. How do you trace the system calls that the DOS Flash program is making? How do you find out what it's talking to the hardware about? To do this, I ended up writing my own virtual machine, um, which was, again, a lengthy process, but it wasn't a difficult process. Um, I was helped along by an article somebody had written a while ago that has some example code in it. And that example code had most of a working um, virtual machine using the KVM acceleration framework. And I could just start from that. I was able to actually get the DOS Flash XE booted up into that virtual machine and running, and I would pretend to be DOS, and I would wait for it to call me, and I'd print out the calls that it made as it went. And to do this meant that I had to discover um, what the interrupts were, which is there's things online that, that people used to use back in the dark ages. They're still online. The Ralph Brown's internet list is something that I remember reading when I was much younger. And it's still a reference that still works. But the, um, the tool itself was compiled, the DOS Flash AC tool was compiled by a thing called DJCCC, a uh, CCP. DJCPP, um, uh, which is the guy's name's version of GCC. And it was a 32-bit compiler for a DOS 16-bit system, which uses this CWS DPMI thing, which at the time I thought was going to make my life difficult. But DJCPP was, I've got it wrong, haven't I? That compiler was open source. So I was able to look at how it compiled things, and I was actually just reading the source code of what it did to compile, what its normal environment for compiling was. And that meant that I could find out exactly how to load the DOS Flash XE because it was all there in open source. So that bit was really straightforward. But then I had to go through and write stubs for each of the calls it made until I could print out debug logs of exactly what it was asking from the operating system. And then when I got to the right point, exactly what it was asking from the hardware. So it turned out DOS Flash was making system management mode calls, SMM calls. And that's where I was able to extract the protocol that it was talking about. And it was, you know, there's a transaction that it was making, it was asking for resources and getting replies back. So there's actual protocol in there that DOS Flash was doing. You might not know what system management mode is. I'm sure you know what a user space is. And then we've got kernel mode, and then we've got the hypervisor. System management mode is a bit of code that runs on your computer. Most computers have them again. It's more privileged than the virtual machine hypervisor. It's more privileged than any other bit of code running on your system, other than some other tricks that could be called system management mode as well. It's more privileged than almost anything. And this is another area where people who like to have 
uh, laptops or hardware without, um, without blobs, with only open source, they'll talk about how can we remove the system management mode. But it's the spot where the vendor stores their tricks. So if they want to have some magic way of programming their Flash, they could write the program for doing that and put it in system management mode. And then in this case, DOS Flash makes the call into system management mode and ask for it to do things. And I kind of got to the point where I could brick hardware and stopped. I chose not to brick any hardware because I've only got one, I only had one board that I could test with at that point and it was the wrong board. So I didn't want to brick the hardware. Um, so it was almost a dead end there, but again, um, I, I now know more about how the system management mode worked and I can't argue that that was useful. It hasn't been so far. But the other thing that that led me to was how was the code protected in the first place? The firmware that you upload, can anybody upload it? Can anybody call this system management interface? And yeah, the firmware was protected by the checksum and it was slightly protected by a minor amount of encryption. But beyond that, and clearly we broke that, that's how we got it patched in the first place. It wasn't protected. Now if we go to the newer versions of the same laptop series, they change this. They start protecting it different ways. The current model has got um, no encryption at all, but it's got a what looks to me like a uh, uh, cryptographic signature appended to the end of the firmware. Um, as yet, I haven't put a lot of effort into trying to reverse engineer that because I haven't needed to, but I feel like that's a much more difficult thing. There's quite a lot of, there's 256 bytes there, so it's quite a large checksum. It's probably quite difficult to uh, figure out what their private key they're using is. So, but just this year, um, I think it was in March, somebody did a talk at the Black Hat conference and their talk was, hey, we can inject bad firmware into certain laptops which would allow a persistent attack to exist inside a part of the laptop that you can't see. So Lenovo uh, released a, uh, a security advisory for this and their advisory says that people can patch the firmware and we don't want that. So that's what I'm doing. Which means that at this point, any new firmware released by Lenovo is protected in a way that I can't patch it and successfully reflash. Which is annoying, but I've found that most of the updates to the BIOS that they release don't necessarily fix problems I'm having. So if I stay on the last known good version, I can continue to make patches to my firmware if I need to. And it turns out there was actually one person who was able to test it. He upgraded to the wrong version and discovered that he can still downgrade to the last known good version. There's a setting in the BIOS where you can say allow, allow rollbacks to happen. And he turned that on and was able to roll back to the earlier version. So unfortunately, this is kind of the end of the road for patching that old laptop, which is sad, but I think I got a lot more value and a lot more time out of it than I expected because I didn't expect to support as many laptops as I did. So in a way, it, it kind of means that I'm winding up that part of the project. But while I still enjoy the laptop that I've fixed, I only fixed one. <laughs> I fixed my laptop and I'm happy with that. Um, I am even using um, the, the battery patch as well. I'm putting the, the older batteries that I had from some of my old laptops lying around. And I use it every day. It's still the laptop I use every day. It's quite an old laptop now. And yeah, it's not the fastest one, but I'm not trying to play games on it. It's still quite usable for me. And I still quite enjoy the fact that I've got that. But it's old. 
and it ultimately it will die and I won't necessarily be able to replace it. So I still want to look for other laptops. I want to look for laptops that fit my, better fit my list from way back in the beginning, where I just said, this is what I'd like for my ideal laptop. And maybe try and get some new ThinkPad hardware. I have to wait for it to come on the second hand market and be cheap enough because it's destructive testing. I want to try and jam the keyboard in. I'm going to have to do case modding to do that. I'm possibly going to blow up parts of it. I'm probably going to break the, um, uh, the firmware if I try and patch it. So I, you know, I can't just go and buy a new one. It's too much money for me to spend. But in the interim, until then, I have an answer for me. I have a laptop that is relatively new with the right keyboard in it. Um, ThinkPad released an anniversary edition that had the old keyboard. They sold it for six months and then they don't sell it anymore. It's impossible to purchase. The only ones that have turned up in the second hand market sold for more than they retailed. You can't buy the keyboard either. I've found a number of sellers online who sell this keyboard and every time you look at their photos, they're showing a photo of the older X220 keyboard. So I don't think they actually have this keyboard. It's got a different connector in there on the inside. It's got a connector that is very similar to the connector that's in a lot of the newer ThinkPad laptops. They standardised on one shape for their um, keyboard connector. And, you know, they standardised it on a different shape earlier. They're standardised on a new shape now. So theoretically, it is possible to play with the keyboards on newer um, ThinkPads. I have one report from somebody who took this laptop and destroyed it and took the next model up laptop and retrofitted the um, motherboard in and he got it kind of working. But that's, um, we're talking about, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to do currency conversions in my head. We're, we're talking about um, uh, probably about 5,000 US dollars worth of hardware as new. <laughs> And one of those is the unobtainium laptop that he couldn't replace if he broke it. So again, I don't think that's viable as an answer. But if I get a laptop that's open source, including the shape files for its plastic mouldings, then I might better get somebody to print out or stamp out a top of the laptop that fits the keyboard. I've got. I've done some measurements of the keyboard. I've made some progress towards, uh, towards cutting out shapes. And, um, and uh, Monday, maybe I'll start trying to learn how to use the 3D printer to print out the right shapes myself. But the important part for me <laughs> was there is at least one known working keyboard adapter that takes the connector on the X220 keyboard and converts it to USB. So it's a standard USB keyboard. And it supports both the track point as well as the keyboard. So it's a mouse and keyboard combo. And I can plug that into anything. That's, I've built, that's the one I've built. Um, it worked. And then I managed to broke the, break the connector in transport. So <laughs> I have to fix it again. Um, but if I find a laptop that I can put the, the keyboard in physically, then this would probably be my answer. Again, if I go back to if I really like the ThinkPads, if I really like the ThinkPad still, perhaps I should say. Um, there is a little bit of room inside the case. I could do the case modding. The key, um, the, the fingerprint reader is a USB device. So here's a board that'll, I throw away the fingerprint reader and use this board and I can jam the right keyboard in. But my basic viewpoint on this is that why would I buy a ThinkPad if the reason why I'm buying is the keyboard? If they're no longer making that keyboard? So why should I give them money? But this is a, you know, what I've got my eye open for for the future. And that kind of brings me to the end of where I am now. I still hope for a future where I have a better laptop. There are a couple of options turning up on the market. They're not perfect, but... And maybe I'll just buy a laptop that has a keyboard that I don't like, and I'll be sad. But... Hopefully, I've shown you some tools and walked you through some techniques that you might be able to use to take some other bit of hardware 
and make it do what you want so that you feel like you've got ownership of your hardware rather than just taking the latest shiny thing and using it the way the manufacturer thinks you should use it. Um, all the slides are going to be online, so you don't have to type in URLs now. Um, I've got some more links uh, in the extra, extra slides after this. So, um, any questions? You mentioned some uh, current options. What are they? So, there's two laptops that I'm, uh, I've been looking at. Uh, for current options, there is um, the one that I'm most interested in is the Pinebook Pro, uh, which is an open source laptop. Uh, it's just gone on the market. It's about 200 US dollars, so it's a cheap laptop. Uh, it's an ARM laptop with uh, four gig of RAM and um, room inside for an NVMe storage. So it's relatively modern. It's just a little bit small and slow compared to if you actually bought a modern laptop. But for $200, I can afford to have a desktop as well. And the desktop will be, have a nice mechanical keyboard and <laughs> I won't be sad. <laughs> so, and for $200, I can afford to break it and try and put a different keyboard in. Uh, I think the other one was uh, Olimex had a, um, a laptop that they were making open source. Uh, it didn't quite have as much expandability, so I'm less interested in that, but it was still an open source laptop. There's also the Aomi 86. Do you know about that? Aomi 86. No, I haven't, uh, haven't come across that. It's only open. So okay. All the hardware is open. Yeah, cool. They're still working on it, but I don't think it's... It's not that powerful, but that's not the end either. Yeah, yeah. It's completely uh, open. And this is, this is why I said I've got to set my scope I'm okay with a less powerful laptop if it fits a lot of my other requirements. And then I can hack on it and say, you know, it's just a remote terminal for something else. But it takes forever to finish this project. I think they <laughs> were supposed to ship it in uh, 2017, possibly. And it keeps running into problems. You know, but the, but the, you know, it's, it's worth it just to follow what he's doing. Because what? the reports that he's publishing is so interesting. What was the name of it? A O M I eighty six, I think. I'll have a look at that. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I think I'll be around for a little bit. So please, oh, question. Um, if there is actually, if there's no totally open laptop, could you not theoretically just put, uh, depending on form factor of course, but put the PCB and all the components in an older ThinkPad so you can get, so you don't need to actually print out a new hot case for the keyboard? The, um, the shapes of the motherboards in the newer ThinkPads um, have changed. They're not really selling something that's the same shape as the older laptop, but yeah, possible. I mean, that's essentially what the guy who managed to get the, um, the 25th anniversary keyboard into his T480 did. You know, he's using the old case. Um, he did a little bit of case modding to get the, um, the holes to line up. But from the sounds of it, it was relatively straightforward to do. But that's two laptops to uh, three months apart. So um, you probably could, actually, if you tried hard enough. And there are, um, there are various projects. There's a, a group in China called NB51 that uh, actually make new motherboards for a bunch of ThinkPad laptops. Um, they have their own questions uh, around them. The, the, it's, uh, it's strange hardware. <laughs> um, it sounds like it works, but again, it's, it's strange hardware that they custom make. So. Uh, and they're using the old case. So um, it's certainly an idea, yeah. And so the proper name was actually EOMA 68. E-O-M-A e 68. Ah, is this the, the, the card shape yeah, thing? Yeah. Card. So the EOMA 68 
uh, is something I think I have heard of. And yeah, they, they've been announcing that they want to release soon for a while. I, I, that makes more sense now. And if I remember, they, they had a plan to make a card that you would buy from lots of different vendors and then you would plug that card into the laptop body of your choice. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so, all standard yeah. so you know, so, yeah, like all tried out, you know, nothing new fancy. <laughs> cool. Well, no other questions? Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for coming.